From Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 28, recorded on February 21st, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be with you from LD Lab Studios. (laughs) (laughs) Nels, it's it's almost 70 degrees here in New York City. Oh, my goodness. Subtract subtract about 50 degrees uh, for my current location in Salt Lake City. A uh, big blast of winter just came in, which we were overdue. We've been hovering above freezing. It's been kind of brown, and the crocuses have been popping out. The daffodils are almost blooming. Um, but then, bang, just in the last couple of days, a uh, massive foot to two foot snowstorm, and it feels like winter again. Well, we had snow on uh, Saturday, this past Saturday. It's all gone. Yep. But I think it'll get cold again, which is fine. Yeah. It's kind of all over the map these days. So you got a meeting you want to talk about briefly? Oh, yeah. Thank you. So quick advertisement. Um, we're going to host a, a SMB satellite meeting. SMB, so this is the Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution. They have regional meetings um, uh, increasingly, and we got chosen to host one here in Utah. So I'll put a link to this. The topic of the meeting is called Molecular Evolution into the Cell. And so we're putting out uh, all points bulletin to people who are evolutionary curious, evolutionary biologists who might be interested in adding cell biology or even microbiology to to sort of the menu, um, or vice versa, microbiologists and cell biologists who are interested in thinking about evolutionary ideas and how the biology might play out in populations. So think about this meeting like Twivo on steroids <laughs> is my <laughs> that's my idea here. And so we'll put the link up. If you're interested at all, get a hold of me. The meeting will be May 9th through 12th at a fancy resort in Deer Valley. Incredible lodging, great food, all-inclusive. So um, hope that folks might take a look at this and and join us um, for a meeting here uh, in vivo in a couple months. Looks great. Yeah, it should be fun. Well, we do have a guest today. And now I'm going to leave it to you to introduce her. Sounds good, Vincent. So, you know, so far on Twivo, our 27 previous episodes or so, we've covered a lot of diverse species and thinking about evolution. We've spent comparatively little time discussing our own species, uh, humans, and uh, the ancestors of humans. And so, you know, and part of this might be what we really do on the podcast have a focus on work that sort of bridges between both uh, kind of evolutionary ideas all the way through to experiments. And we might think of human evolution as one big natural experiment, but of course, there are massive limitations on the kinds of experimental manipulations we do with our own species for ethical reasons. And so today's guest, Sarah Tishka from uh, Penn, University of Pennsylvania, is really one of the uh, world experts on thinking about our own evolution. And so I'm really thrilled that she's joining us on the show today. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks. It's great to be joining you guys. From from Philadelphia, right? Yes, and it's very warm here as well. <laughs> yeah, you should. You're not that far from us, so you should That's be. True. Yeah. Well, That's thanks true. for joining us. We would uh, like to start by finding out a bit about you, like uh, your training. But where were you born and raised initially? Well, I was born in Los Angeles, California, mm-hmm. where my father taught at the medical school at UCLA. Cool. And then. Uh, at around beginning of elementary school, we moved to the Midwest to East Lansing, Michigan, and uh, spent a number of years there before moving to a very small town called Klamath Falls, Oregon, <laughs> up in up in the Cascade Mountains. And then after that, I uh, went to Berkeley for my undergraduate uh, studies and then went to Yale for graduate school. So what did your dad teach at uh, UCLA? Well, he was a hematologist and oncologist. Ah, cool. You think that was an impetus for you to go into science? Possibly, <laughs> but I would. I, I'm also going to say that my mother played a role because she uh, had a PhD in history, uh-huh. and she taught history for many years. 
somehow I ended up in between. So I ended up when I started Berkeley, I was interested in anthropology. I actually wanted to be a cultural anthropologist. Huh. I was uh, inspired by Margaret Mead. And she had written um, a book about the uh, sort of a cultural anthropological study of the Samoans. And that's what I was going to do. I went to Berkeley thinking, I'm going to be a cultural anthropologist. Mm. And when I went there, um, there this was a time when uh, molecular anthropology was just um, kind of at its beginnings. And it was uh, Alan Wilson, brilliant scientist who was at UC Berkeley at the time, and a number of his academic offspring, including Vince Sarich and Mary Claire King, who went on to um, uh, identify the BRCA1 gene that uh, causes breast cancer. And so, it was just a really exciting time, and uh, I decided to integrate my interest in human evolution, human origins with uh, genetic studies. So, I sort of feel like I got this balance of both the kind of the humanities, social sciences, and the biological sciences. So, maybe both parents had an influence. Mm -hmm. So, you ended up getting a, you said it was a PhD at Berkeley, is that right? No, did my undergraduate, undergraduate studies there. Sorry. I had a dual major in anthropology and genetics. I got it. And th did you go to grad school right out of Berkeley? Uh, I took a year and worked at UCSF doing huh. research at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute there. Oh, what kind of stuff did you do there? Um, looking at the genetics of... Um, I'm trying to remember, sorry. <laughs> oh, hold on. There goes my phone. Hold on one sec. Uh, Let me just... No problem. I'll just... I'll, I'll jump in for a second here just to mention... Um, I had the honor of hosting Sarah for a seminar here at Utah a couple years ago. Uh -huh. And, you know, one of the things as uh, w one of my jobs as a host is to introduce Sarah's talk. And so, um, you know, one of the fun things is to always try to find, kind of scour the Internet or find some interesting details to mm. um, to raise, to kind of pique everyone's interest. And so I was I went on to um, Reddit and found a Ask Me Anything session <laughs> <laughs> that Sarah hosted a few years ago. And it was a goldmine for, uh, for an introduction. So this, um, you mentioned your, um, how Margaret Mead was an influence. And then also just, it was fa it's fascinating. And actually, we'll put the link to, if that's okay with you, Sarah, we'll put the link sure. to the AMA session because sure. this is an opportunity for our listeners to sort of um, – see kind of a deep dive on all of the questions that folks were asking and really fascinating answers and also a lot of info about mm. uh, Sarah's background and, and interests. So nice wow. resource there. It's a great uh, little conversation. Did you enjoy that Reddit, uh, Sarah? Is that cool? Well, that was kind of um, a little intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> I had never done anything like that where you're just getting hit by questions and you have to just type as quickly as you possibly can and answer them on the spot. But yeah. I had a great time. I thought people asked excellent questions and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Reddit can be a good place. Yeah. Nels, you should do one. Yeah. I haven't yet. Have you? No. Uh, my son yeah. well, keeps telling me to do it. He says, dad, you should do a Reddit AMA. Okay. Why don't you <laughs> set it up for me and I'll do it. <laughs> All right. So Berkeley and, and you worked a year at UCSF. Did you remember what you were working on? Not yeah, so <laughs> at UCSF, I was working on the um, genetics of sex determination. Okay. And at that time, we didn't actually know what the gene was on the Y chromosome that made men men. Mm -hmm. Cool. So after that, you went to grad school. Where was that? Uh, I went to graduate school at Yale in the Department of Genetics. Uh -huh. And that was with uh, Ken Kidd, who was a human population geneticist who worked very closely with Luca Cavalli Sforza, mm. who was at Stanford. And together, they had established the largest uh, collection of immortalized cell lines from which you can get DNA. So it's sort of a long term source of DNA from populations around the world. Wow. That's great, right? How many how many uh, different samples are in that? Hundreds? Uh, over, well over a thousand. Neat. Yeah. That's nice because you don't have to go in the field and collect anything, right? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> Actually, not true. <laughs> because at that time, um, the only two African populations that they had mm. were two uh, so-called pygmy populations. These are rainforest hunter-gatherer populations. One of them is an ethnic group called the Biaka, and the other one's called Mbuti. And they were using this, not just uh, Kenneth Kidd and Luca Cavalli Sforza, but many people used these samples and did uh, analyses from the data that was generated. And they were <laughs> looking at these um, Central African 
populations as being somehow representative of mm-hmm. all of Africa. And they were being used as sort of an outgroup of studies of non-Africans. And when I did my PhD work, I started recognizing the diversity amongst African populations. And I had to write to many different people. There weren't many people who had collected DNA samples from ethnically diverse uh, Africans. So I wrote to the few people who had and formed collaborations and characterized variation in the nuclear genome. And to my surprise, I was looking at a particular region um, that codes for uh, a gene or that has a Uh, We were looking at a region that contains the gene CD4, and this codes for a protein that plays an important role in immunity. But we were looking at variation, haplotype variation, so looking at different variants that are linked together um, along a small region of the chromosome. And in that particular region, we found that when we looked at European populations, they looked pretty similar. When we looked amongst the Asian populations, they look pretty similar. The Asian and the European populations, there were some differences, but again, not that terribly different. We start looking at a handful of African populations, and they are so different from each other in terms of the uh, different types of haplotypes that they have, really strikingly different. And I thought, wow, what is that telling us about the population history in Africa? And it became my um, passion to do field work in Africa and to start sampling from ethnically diverse populations and to better characterize genomic diversity in that region. Did that have anything to do with uh, HIV using CD4 as a receptor? So, um, oh gosh, now this is where Nels is going to have to come in. <laughs> <laughs> I just, was was this after the we recognized HIV? Or? Oh no, this yeah, this was. Uh, I'm trying to remember what year was this. Yeah, it was certainly after we recognized yeah. HIV. Mm-hmm. But um, this, is, so it is actually conceivable um, that this gene could play a role in infectious disease resistance. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we were looking at um, non-coding regions. We're actually looking at regions nearby. So not not variation within the gene itself. We were looking sort of in that region nearby. Um, And I don't think selection can fully explain this. And in fact, when we went on to study more populations and look at more regions of the genome, we found exactly the same thing. Lots of variation, not just within African populations, but between African populations. And so that's telling us something about their population history. We know that modern humans originated in Africa. Um, We just, there was a study this past year that um, pushed that date back to about 300,000 years ago. They found a fossil of um, uh, anatomically modern human individual from Morocco. Hmm. Prior prior to that, we thought it was around 200,000 years ago, but that sort of pushed it back by possibly another 100,000 years. And uh, we know that modern humans arose in Africa. We still don't know where. We certainly see evidence for modern human behavior in a number of different places in Africa. Some of the... um, Oldest uh, artifacts were find, found in a cave in South Africa, and they actually found an artist's toolkit that was dated to over 100,000 years ago, where they were using um, mixing pigments in a shell, and then they would use that either for cave painting or maybe for body decoration. Um, but part of the problem, one of the reasons we don't know where in Africa modern humans uh, originated is that we don't have great preservation of fossils or archaeological data in certain regions of mm-hmm. Africa, mm-hmm. and particularly regions that are uh, tropical in climate. They just don't preserve very well. So we're getting sort of we're getting a biased perspective. We're seeing things from East Africa, North Africa, Southern Africa. Um, but we know that after, modern humans originated in Africa, it looks like they had maintained a relatively large um, population size. They were also very subdivided for a very long period of time. And then you have these uh, ancient and more recent migration events and admixture interbreeding between populations. So it's a very complex demographic history. And that's what explains that pattern that we were seeing. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, after then they migrated out of Africa sometime between 50 to 80,000 years ago, giving rise to populations around the rest of the world. Mm, right. So cool. So, yeah. And so then Sarah, so you had, 
you know, you're starting to build these connections on the ground in Africa um, and creating relationships with folks. So then maybe give us a sense of that transition then from your PhD work to your postdoc work and how this all sort of kind of um, intermingled as you continued your training. Sure. Well, I decided to do um, postdoctoral work with Andy Clark, who is now at Cornell, but he was at Penn State University at that time. And he's a brilliant uh, population geneticist who has it all. He combines, you know, uh, laboratory research with theoretical statistical population genetics. And that's something I wanted to learn more about. But at the time when I went to Andy Clark's lab, he didn't really have much of a human genetics component. He was studying fruit flies, Drosophila. And I was really fortunate. I applied for and got a Burroughs Welcome Fund Career Award. And it enabled me to basically set up my own human genetics lab in Andy's lab. (laughs) So (laughs) I bought my own equipment. I bought my own reagents. I had undergrads working for me, not grad students. But then I got to work with this brilliant person. It was, to me, one of the best times of my life. But Before, right after I got to Penn State, (laughs) um, I actually did a short visiting uh, research scientist position at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, with a guy named Trevor Jenkins, who was really the leader in studying African genetics. And he had mainly been focusing on um, populations from Southern Africa, including the click-speaking San populations who were... Uh, until recently, traditionally hunters and gatherers, and uh, have some. They have the oldest genetic lineages in the world, so they are descended from a population that is ancestral to all modern humans. And uh, that was interesting for a number of reasons, um, both scientifically and just sociologically and poli- politically. It was right after the end of apartheid, um, so it was just a very interesting time. But While I was there, there was a meeting that was held in Cape Town that was on the um, history of the click-speaking San populations. And it was a really unique meeting because it brought together an interdisciplinary group of scientists. There were cultural anthropologists, archaeologists, linguists. There were geneticists, historians, um, and representatives from these uh, Sawn populations from throughout Southern Africa, and it really inspired me. And when I was there, I was talking to some of the linguists and the um, the archaeologists, the anthropologists, and I said, you know, what's the most interesting, outstanding question? And they said, you should go to Tanzania and study the Hadza and the Sandawi populations, who also speak with clicks. Um, so these these populations, uh, these languages that contain cliques in Africa have been classified as a language family called Khoisan, but they're very different from each other. So the language is spoken by these two groups in Tanzania. They're very different from each other, and they're very different from the San populations in Southern Africa. Uh, But it's very unique to have these click consonants. So um, they said, you should go there and try to figure out what is their relatedness to the San in Southern Africa. And that's what inspired me. And after that, I, um, as a postdoc, wrote an NSF um, grant proposal and did this together with uh, Joanna Mountain, who was at Stanford at the time. Now she's at um, the company 23andMe. Mm. And we had just independently come up with this idea <laughs> that we both wanted to look at these populations in Tanzania. So we thought, well, let's join forces, let's do it together. And we uh, wrote this uh, application jointly, and we were successful at getting it funded. And my goal was uh, to start doing the field work. As uh, as soon as I had started my faculty position, I started in the year 2000 at the University of Maryland in uh, College Park. And uh, just when we're about to start, (laughs) the uh, government of Tanzania puts a hold on all research. Mm-hmm. Actually, they put a hold on for three years. I had to wait. <laughs> right. And uh, eventually that hold was lifted, and then we were able to start in 2001. Mm. And did you complete that study? We did. And <laughs> just to show you the pace of science, <laughs> we still don't know the answer. <laughs> so but at the, we did. But at the, <laughs> yep. But at the same time, just to say, going from those early days uh, of your graduate work with a couple of cell lines 
to this incredibly rich and diverse set of connections and access to um, cultures and also, you know, the biology on uh, the diverse biology in African populations. I mean, my God, that is a massive um, move forward. Yeah, I, I mean, and you have to imagine that when I initiated this field work, it was basically me alone, and I um, um, identified collaborators who were uh, a geneticist and biochemist at um, Muhumbili uh, Medical School in Dar es Salaam, and also an archaeologist at the University of Dar es Salaam, and some of his students, you know, were part of the team. So, but I had never done field work, ever. <laughs> I had <laughs> no experience. I had never been to Africa. I didn't know what to expect. Let's just say that I'm not really good. I always tend to overpack. Well, I really overpack for that trip initially because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, are we going to be sleeping outside in tents? And we did sometimes. It was good that I brought the tent. We didn't always need it. But, you know, I brought every piece of camping equipment. I had to bring the whole portable lab with me. I worked on protocols uh, first in the lab at University of Maryland to try to perfect, perfect them and sort of practice on ourselves and make sure it's going to work. Mm. But you never know until you get to the field. It was all a big unknown. And I kind of just learned as I went along. Mm. Best best way, right? I guess. <laughs> it's a little risky, but in this yeah, case, yeah, sure. it, it worked out. <laughs> yeah, well, people have all kinds of stories about bringing stuff and nothing works and having to improvise. Right. So um, what brought you to, to Penn? So in... Um, 2008, after I was an associate uh, professor at University of Maryland, that was a fantastic uh, place. I was in the Department of Biology, and they have a wonderful evolutionary biology program. Um, for me, it was a little isolating, though, because there's not a medical school there, mm. and uh, there was not there was no one else really studying human genetics. And uh, partly also for personal reasons, I have family and my husband is based in Philadelphia. And so when an opportunity arose at the University of Pennsylvania, um, I thought that was a really good opportunity to pursue. And it was a uh, unique type of position. It was an endowed chair. It's called the Penn Integrates Knowledge uh, Professor positions mm. that were established by Amy Gutman, who's um, president at University of Pennsylvania. And she established this initiative to try to promote interdisciplinary uh, research and collaborations. And so these uh, uh, positions were for people who were doing interdisciplinary work and would have um, appointments in two different schools. So I'm in the School of Medicine and the School of Arts and Sciences. I'm in two departments, Department of Biology and uh, Department of Genetics. And so that's a really unique opportunity for someone like me who has a really interdisciplinary uh, yeah, background and nice. interest. When you were at Maryland, did you know Ann Simon? I knew. Oh gosh, I'm trying to remember. So she's a virologist. Yeah. I, I did not know her well. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we have a big virology meeting there this summer. Oh, Mar that's right. American Society for Virology. So looking forward to that. Looking forward to being able to drive to a meeting instead of flying. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So now, can, so, you, should, can you get us into the paper? Yeah, let's do that. I did want to ask, though, really quickly, Sarah, just because you mentioned it, that really unique um, setup of being in between arts and sciences and in the medical school. How does that kind of play out on a given all of the interdisciplinary work that you're doing? Do you sort of have a 50-50 foot in both departments or how does that kind of work on a daily basis, I guess? Well, I do have a 50-50 um, appointment and a foot in both departments that comes with, you know, there's some positive things and there's some challenges, of course, because you're trying to be in two places at one time and that's never quite possible. The good thing about Penn is that nothing's far away. We're all one campus. So unlike other um, schools where the medical school is sort of in a different location, sometimes it's in a different town, we're all together on one campus. So I can get from my office at the medical school to the Department of Biology in five minutes. So that really helps to facilitate interactions with people. There's no um, boundaries. There's no walls here. Um, but the main uh, way that this affects me is in terms of my teaching responsibilities. So typically, if you're a faculty in the medical school, you're going to be teaching medical students and, you're, and or you're going to be teaching graduate students who are in the School of Medicine. I do do some of that, but in addition, I teach undergraduate students, and that's really the main difference. People at the medical school don't typically teach undergrad students, but for me, that was a major attraction. Why 
not <laughs> interact with undergrads if you're coming to a great place like Penn. So that's that's one of the the differences. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, yeah. So let's um, want to move ahead with today's paper. And so maybe you could we could start, Sarah, by just making the transition. So you mentioned sort of this longstanding interest in some of the languages and the click um, dialects among Africans. So today's paper, which uh, came out uh, in Science last fall, is entitled Loci Associated with Skin Pigmentation Identified in African Populations. Can you just give us sort of the origin story of this study and how it all sort of came together? Sure. Well, um, as part of the work, the research that we've done in Africa, which involves a lot of field work, um, and I want to mention that ever since I had kids, it's much harder for me to go into the field for months at a time. <laughs> and in fact, nowadays, um, when I was going, um, when I was a junior faculty member, it was about three to four months at a time. Now it's a minimum six months to as much as a year. And so I have research scientists in my lab who are dedicated to that. Um, uh, senior research scientist Alessia Ranciaro has been leading the field work for many years. Right now, I also have a postdoc from Cameroon, Eric Mbunwe, who is doing some of that field work as well. But as part of those, uh, you know, this field work, we've interacted with many different ethnic groups across Africa. We have worked in Western, Central Africa, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and in addition to seeing tremendous diversity in terms of language and culture, and of course, now we know genetics, we could see that people look really different as well. And one of the most striking things to me were the differences in skin color. And for example, uh, people who um, speak Nilo-Saharan languages, they originated in southern Sudan. So uh, these would include, for example, Maasai or um, the Nuer or the Dinka they had really, really darkly pigmented skin. And on the other extreme were the click-speaking San populations, who I said had the oldest, have the oldest genetic lineages. They're relatively lighter, more lightly pigmented. And so I think a lot of people didn't recognize that Africa is not a homogeneous place in terms of skin color. There's a, quite a bit of variation. And all of the studies up until, you know, the time that we published that had really almost all, all but one, had focused on European populations and to a, a lesser extent, uh, Asian, East Asian populations. So there was just essentially nothing known. Mm -hmm. And maybe just to um, get started, too. So there's the, and maybe putting this in this somewhat of an evolutionary um, perspective. So there is this idea, right, that our ancestors, at least, were probably pretty hairy um, creatures. And so uh, there, there's a great quote that you had, and there, there's a preview piece um, written by Ann Gibbons to this paper um, in Science. You have a great quote there. It's, if you shave a chimpanzee, its skin is light. <laughs> <laughs> that infamous quote. I should have right. said it differently. I do not, I just want to say for everybody out there, I do not shave chimpanzees. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my next but, question. But yeah. <laughs> if one were, if a chimpanzee was shaved for some reason, actually, what you can do is. I know this sounds funny, but if you just did a Google search for naked ape, <laughs> you will see chimps without any any body hair. Mm -hmm. And some of them have um, a disease, an autoimmune disorder, where they lose their hair. And so you can actually mm -hmm. see what their skin color looks like. And it's not super dark. So there wouldn't have been any reason to have really darkly pigmented skin if you've got body hair right. and you're protected from UV exposure. Did all Homo sapiens... Um Black body hair, or was there a time when they were hairy? Well, I'm sure at some point in our origins, there was a time when we were hairy. Yeah. Um, but the thought was that um, during the um, origin of the genus Homo, so say somewhere in the order of roughly 3 million, 2.83 million years ago, that our ancestors left the forest and went into the savanna. There would have been selection then to decrease body hair and increase the number of sweat glands for thermoregulation. Mm. But if you decrease the body hair, then there's going to be selective pressures to have a more darkly pigmented mm -hmm. skin. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And but is, I, go ahead. I just want I want to mention though that that when we started the study, uh, people who had stu who studied the evolution of skin color had talked about 
they had talked about this as if um, once this uh, people, the our ancestors left the forest, they went to the savanna, their selection for dark skin, and then people in Africa became really dark and they stayed really dark, the, you know, <laughs> for the rest of their evolutionary history. And what our study show our study showed is that's not the case. People thought that there was such strong selection for dark skin color across all Africans that there would be um, selective constraint on genes that play a role in skin color. So MC1R is one of the ones um, that people talk about. And it may be correct at that gene. It looks like there is some kind of selective constraint. But people didn't recognize that there could be variation in Africa for genetic variants that play a role in skin color. So when we when we look at the range of skin color in Africa, you mentioned it before, um, what what would account for that range? What are the forces that would do that? So we, we don't know. Uh, that's the truthful answer. Um, so, for example, I'm fascinated by the fact that that people who speak Nilo-Saharan languages who originated in southern Sudan are so darkly pigmented. They're the most darkly pigmented people in the world. Um, some of the variants that they have for dark skin are actually derived, meaning that the ancestral state, the state that's closer to chimpanzee, are the variants associated with light skin. Mm. Okay. So it looks like they've been evolving really dark skin, and some populations have been evolving really light skin, like the sun in southern Africa. We don't know why. In the case of the sun, one could speculate that it has to do with uh, UV exposure, because the hypothesis about why um, there has been evolution for differences in skin color in humans is that when modern humans left Africa somewhere between 50 to 80,000 years ago, and they moved to um, higher uh, latitudes, and there's less UV exposure, um, that that could be problematic because UV exposure is important for the synthesis of vitamin D, which is actually something that occurs in the skin. So if you're not getting as much UV and you're darkly pigmented, you may not be producing Mm. vitamin D, which can have really um, deleterious uh, effects. Whereas if you're closer to the equator and you're exposed to a lot of UV, there would be selection for darker skin, both as protection from skin cancer and for anyone who thinks, oh, that's that's not really a selective pressure. Well, I also study albinos in Africa, and the majority of them have severe skin cancer by the age of 20. So it, it can be, it, it is really detrimental if you don't have darkly pigmented skin. And it's also protective against degradation of folate. And folate's really important for the proper development of the fetus. So there would be strong selection for dark skin. Now, why we see that variation it could be some people hypothesize that the San, who currently live in Southern Africa, originated in uh, Eastern Africa, which would be closer to the equator. Maybe when they migrated, down to Southern Africa where there's less UV. Maybe there'd be selection for lighter skin. We just don't know. Mm. Maybe sexual selection is playing a role. Maybe the Nilo-Saharans per, you know, prefer mm. darker skin mates. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we, we don't entirely know. But I also think that one of the things we found in the study is that the genes that we identify that are playing a role in skin pigmentation are pleiotropic, meaning that they have effects on many different aspects of physiology, maybe even infectious disease resistance, they're doing multiple things. And so we have to think about it from that perspective. It may not be one single thing, Mm. like UV exposure. Who knows? It might turn out that infectious disease is actually impacting skin color. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So in going from, uh, to get to the genes or to get to the genotypes, whatever the sort of natural selection or range of different um, forces or influences in our evolutionary history, in the evolutionary history of the African populations, you have to quantify phenotypes. And so maybe we could spend some time talking about that in order to capture sort of quantitatively the range of skin skin pigmentation in Africa. How do you quantify that? So we use a a machine called a spectrophotometer, and basically you shine a light and you do this in a couple of places. You want to do it under the arm if you want to get a region of the body that's not exposed to a lot of sunlight. And then in comparison, you we typically we get it all get a measurement on the um the top of the wrist. So that almost that tells you you can also look at tanning that way. 
So you can compare the pigmentation of um, skin that's not exposed to UV and skin that is exposed to UV. And you look at the um, wavelength of the light that is reflected off of the skin. In the, um, um, and based on that wavelength, you can actually infer what the melanin levels are. And melanin is a pigment that is um, sort of dark brown to black in color that plays a role in uh, dark skin color. The other pigment that plays a role is pheomelanin, which uh, is more yellow and sort of reddish in color. So the amounts of each of those pigments, which are produced in um, melanosomes, an organelle within a melanocyte, which is a uh, cell that you have in your skin, uh, that's going to play a role in skin color. So I'm curious, when you ask someone if you could use this instrument on their skin, did you ever get any people who were worried about it or wary in any, in any way? <laughs> no, no? Not, the, not this one. I think they could see, we, you know, we show them, we do it on ourselves and they could see it's quite harmless, doesn't hurt at all. Yeah. Uh, we're basically just shining a light on the skin. Are the blood draws a little more, or is, is that more tricky to negotiate that space of actually donating blood? In, in so, any- Yes, of course, um, people may be more concerned about donating blood, but what's really important is that you have to do this research in an ethical manner. And that means Mm -hmm. we don't just go in there and start taking blood. This takes years and years and years. I would say on average, minimum five years per country uh, before we even get to the point of drawing blood. So we have to go through um, ethical review, not only at University of Pennsylvania, but then we have to do it in each country. And that ethical review, minimum, typically a year, often more than that. We have to work closely with collaborators who are from each country. They understand the culture. They understand the um, concerns of people. We also work really closely with representatives from the communities. We spend a lot of time in community discussion and doing sort of um, telling them about the projects, what are potential risks, what are potential benefits, if any, and answering questions. And then ultimately, we have to get individual consent. So there's a lot that goes into this. And there are certainly people who say, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, I'm not interested. <laughs> and that's and that's fine. Yeah. And then there are a lot who are interested. And I think um, for them, the blood drawing, it wasn't such a big deal. I think uh, one of the other things that we study is uh, the fecal microbiome. I think they were more, some of them had more concern about providing fecal samples, actually, <laughs> blood samples, believe it or not. But you just, you have to be really sensitive, culturally sensitive. Sure. Can you, so can you give us the overview of the study design? Yeah. So after uh, we first measure the, the phenotypic diversity, which is uh, the pigmentation, we infer the pigmentation levels. And then from the blood, we can isolate DNA. And then uh, together with um, collaborators at NIH, Stephen Chanick and Meredith Yeager, um, they did genotyping uh, using um, what's called a genotyping array, or sometimes we call it a single nucleotide polymorphism SNP array. Basically, you're looking at, in our case, we looked at over 4 million variable sites in the genome, and you genotype them in each individual. And Using that data, you can then do something called a genome-wide association study. So basically what you're doing is you're looking for um, associations between variation, genetic variation, and the trait, in this case, skin color. And the idea being that if you see a strong correlation, a strong association, then that genetic marker, that variable site, is likely physically closely linked to whatever the causal um, gene is or the causal variant is that is influencing skin color. So it's a way for us to map genes that are playing a role in skin color. So after we um, identified these regions and we found four um, regions that showed very strong and significant associations, and then you have to, then it gets really tricky because then you got to dig in and you have to figure out, okay, there could be a lot of genes in some regions, right? So then you have to figure out, well, what's the actual gene that is playing a role in skin color? And um, there were a number of ways we could determine that. Interestingly, the very top associated gene that we found was SLC24A5, 
And that was the very first gene ever identified to play a role in skin color in European populations. And interestingly, the way that was found was by somebody who was studying zebrafish. Mm-hmm. And they saw this pigmentation phenotype in the fish, where they're really easy. You could see, you know, the thing about zebrafish, you can easily detect if they're darkly pigmented or lightly pigmented. And um, he mapped this gene, and then they looked at, um, tried to identify variation in this gene and looked if it correlated with skin color in uh, Europeans, and sure enough, it did. Mm. So that gene is also playing a role in skin color in Africa, and it was most common in East African populations that have experienced gene flow from outside of Africa. And what we were able to show by looking at the chromosomal background, the haplotypes on which the, uh, this mutation associated with light skin occurs, we were able to show that um, it's on the same haplotype background or the same chromosomal background as Europeans. And so what that means is it did not evolve independently. Mm. It was introduced from outside of Africa. We know there's been gene flow migration back into Africa. In this case, I think we can date it. It's very difficult to date it exactly, but I think it had to have been earlier than 5,000 years ago. And the reason I say that is that it's now very common in Tanzania and populations that have ancestry that originated in Ethiopia. They speak um, what's called Cushitic languages. And that migration event, archaeologists um, know and linguists have um, inferred that that occurred around 5,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. So I think it was introduced into that region by migration from Ethiopia. So I think it was it's pretty old. And um, we estimate that that mutation became common uh, outside of Africa uh, around 30,000 years ago. And now in Europeans, the variant associated uh, with the light skin color, with light skin color is at almost 100% frequency. Hmm. And then um, the next strongest association we found was near a gene called MFSD12. When we started the study, it didn't have a name. It was just called open reading frame and then some number. <laughs> In fact, if, if if you even do a search for this now, if you go to like a PubMed and you do a search for MFSD12, only our study comes up. Okay, so this was really not characterized almost at all. But the only clue that we had was that there had been a study of somebody was looking at vitiligo, and that's an autoimmune disorder that causes destruction of melanosome of the melanocytes where the melanin is produced. So people who have that, if they're say um, they have African ancestry, if you have that disorder, you have patches of skin that uh, is depigmented mm-hmm. and light in color. And so they looked at what genes were expressed. So looking at RNA levels in the light uh, patches of skin versus the more darkly pigmented skin. And this gene, which at the time they didn't know the name of it, open reading frame, whatever, was one of the most differential. Um, had diff- the biggest difference in the amount of RNA um, between the light and the darkly pigmented skin. And then a collaborator of ours um, had simultaneously shown that uh, MFSD12 is really, really highly expressed in melanocytes relative to other um, cell types. And so we have, you know, now we have an interesting candidate gene and see that it you know, was identified in a study of vitiligo, so maybe it has something to do with uh, skin color. So once we had um, this candidate gene, MFSD12, the next step is we have to prove what's it actually doing and is it having any impact on pigmentation. So we collaborated with Bill Pavin um, and Stacey Loftus at uh, NIH, and um, they and their collaborators at NIH and colleagues um, knocked out the gene using a technique called CRISPR-Cas9. They could actually knock out the gene in zebrafish and in um, mouse models. Now, when they knocked it out in the zebrafish, the phenotype was pretty subtle, and it was mainly impacting a type of cell called a xanthophore. And this is a cell type that is producing uh, yellow pigment. So there's a clue that, okay, it's, it's influencing a cell type that's influencing production of yellow pigment in a zebrafish. But when he knocked it out in the mouse, it was much more dramatic. So when you knock it out in a mouse uh, that has an agouti, it's an agouti mouse, and it's sort of a, a reddish-brownish color, you knock out this gene, 
and then the mouse becomes gray. And the gray is actually the underlying color of the mouse. And so what it's doing is it's, um, it's impacting production of pheomelanin, which is the yellowish, you know, reddish color pigment. But then we wanted to know what is this gene doing in the cell? So for that, we turn to our uh, colleagues here at University of uh, Pennsylvania, Mickey Marks and um, his postdoc, Shanna Bauman, and they study cell, they're cell biologists. And so what they do is they knock out the, um, well, first they say, where is this gene expressed? In um, they were looking at mouse melanocytes, and they saw that, um, to our surprise, it was not expressed in the melanosome, which is sort of the logical place <laughs> where you expect a protein to be expressed that is influencing development of pigments that are made in the melanosome. So it was not there. It was actually in the lysosome. So it's somehow indirectly impacting um, the uh, production of those pigments, or at least of melanin. So then he knocks out the gene in, uh, in melanocytes and looks at what's the impact. Well, lo and behold, he knocks it out and you see that the cells become darker. And you could see an increase. You literally just look under a microscope and you see that they get darker. And you can see an increase in the production of melanin. So what we think that means is that this gene, the, the product of this gene, is somehow directly impacting production of pheomelanin and indirectly impacting production of melanin in the opposite manner. So then the next step of this is to um, ask what's the impact, you know, of overexpressing, you know, do people of African ancestry, do they have higher levels of this gene or do they have lower levels uh, um, of this expressed gene? And so then um, uh Grad student in my lab, Derek Kelly, and our collabor collaborators, um, Kevin Brown uh, at NIH, they looked at RNA-seq data from melanocytes and showed that um, people with African ancestry had lower levels of expression of this gene. Mm -hmm. So it's somehow down-regulated. And that made sense in terms of what we found from the cell biology studies and from the um, looking at the model organisms. And so then the next step of something like this is you say, okay, I think I got the gene. <laughs> you know, I think that I can, this is definitely playing a role in pigmentation. Now, what are the actual variants that are causal in that region? And we found two independent regions. One of them is um, nearby the gene, upstream of it, so about 8,000 base pairs away. And then um, we can look to see that it overlaps predicted regulatory regions. And then uh, Derek Kelly was able to show that variation in this predicted regulatory region is correlated with expression of the gene. So it seems to be in a transcription factor binding site in an enhancer region. Um, then another postdoc in the lab, Marcia Beltram, she um, uses um, cell studies. She does something called a luciferase expression assay, where you basically you take this predicted enhancer, you put it together with a promoter in um, the appropriate cell type, and then you look to see if it, ex if it influences gene expression. And it did. So it's you have to use all these different types of um, um, experiments and studies. And it also goes to show you that very few people or labs could do this on their own. This yeah. had to be, this mm -hmm. had to be a collaborative study. And it was such a great experience to work together with this team where everybody got along. And, mm. um, and I should also mention that the person who uh, led the genome wide association study was um, a postdoc in my lab, Nick Crawford. Um, so it was a great example of how if you work as a team, you can solve really exciting problems. So we were talking about these candidate genes that you identified and prioritized as being highly associated with specific um, pigment patterns or, or quantified pigment patterns among different populations. Could you spend just a minute telling us about a little bit about that process of how you prioritize these gene candidates? So in the paper, you talk about this program called Caviar, and I'm wondering, um, what is this analysis for sort of identifying GWAS targets and prioritizing them? Sure. Well, that's a method, um, a statistical method that was developed by Elazar Eskin and uh, members of his lab. And uh, basically, it's a way to do fine mapping. So the problem is that when you map, you know, we look for an association in some and we find it in some region. 
And what you'll find is that there are going to be many variants in that region associated, and it might cover a pretty large region. Now, the thing about looking at Africans is because of their demographic history and their population history, because of the fact that they're so old and they've been very large and there's been, you know, there's less linkage to equilibrium in the population between sites, we were able to map down to a much more narrow region than you could otherwise. And in fact, MFSD12 is in a hotspot of recombination. So we got really, really close. We we're actually able to narrow it down to like eight variants. But what that program basically does is that it will take into account patterns of linkage disequilibrium in the region to try to find what are the variants that are independently associated with the trait. Because as it turns out, um, it wasn't just one variant per region. There were multiple independent associations, even in one uh, region of the genome, because they're they're independent. They're not um, uh, in linkage disequilibrium. So that helped us sort of narrow down potential causal variants. And it sounds like from your training that you mainly had an interest in you know genetics of populations, but the laboratory aspects where you get a gene and you bring it back to the lab and you do some experiment wet experiments. Is that a recent addition, or is that some, 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 something that you saw develop in the course of this, or did you always like to do that? No, that's that's more of a recent addition to my lab. We're mm -hmm. getting increasingly interested in doing uh, functional genomics. So yeah. to me, you know, we look for regions of the genome that are associated with some variable trait or with disease risk, or um, we might look for uh, signatures of natural selection in the genome. But to me, it's not satisfying to simply say, oh, yeah. look, I found this gene, right, right. maybe it plays a role, <laughs> or I found this variant, maybe it plays a role. I want to take it to the next step <laughs> and show what's actually causal. How is it impacting this phenotype? And to do that, you really have to do these you know, yeah. cell biology studies, functional genomics. We're starting to look more at uh, gene regulation. Um, now, should I step through the other low side that we found? Sure, sure. Yeah, but let me just, um, for our listeners, just to kind of put an exclamation point maybe on this. So if you look at figure seven, you can see the really um, great biology that step through that Sarah just described from the genetics all the way to the knockout mice, the genetically modified zebrafish in the cell biology. So in figure seven, you can see the zebrafish tails, basically the differences. You can see that agouti mouse and its litter mate that's gray. I can't resist asking Sarah, if you sh shave these mice, do they have different skin? Getting back to that. Sh <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's actually a good question. Um, I don't believe so, but that is a good question. That So, you know, pigmentation phenotype isn't going to be expressed exactly the same in humans and mice. And often things, uh, these genes that are impacting skin color in humans are impacting coat color in mouse. Mm. So they're, you know, they're going to be a little bit different in terms Absolutely. of their biology and physiology, but actually Bill Paven is going to look at that, you know, so well, you have to do some <laughs> follow up. I don't know how many mice he's going to shave. Some like, you know, I think that, I, don't know. I think that gray mouse is pretty sharp looking. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. I, I, that's my favorite picture. I love that. Yeah. It's going up on my wall in my awesome. office. Yeah, good. But um, but the other we found um the third region that we found to be associated was really surprising to me because it was in a cluster of genes that play a role in UV response. Now we know skin color is important for protection from UV, but why would I wasn't expecting it to be um court, you know that the genes that actually impact pigmentation themselves also play a role in UV response, raising a really fascinating question about co you know, co-evolution, you know, and yeah. of these genes for, you know, different aspects of uh, resistance or, or protection from UV. So one of the strongest candidates is a gene called DDB1, and it has a lot of roles, but one of the a very important role that it has is that um, it uh, plays an important role in um, DNA repair after it's damaged from UV exposure. And it forms part of a complex of proteins and people who have um, two mutations or, you know, they have two recessive mutations in genes that are part of this protein complex um, have a horrible disease called xeroderma pigmentosum where they can't be exposed to any sunlight or they will get skin cancer because they can't, um, uh, they can't, uh, they, can't, they can't repair the, the uh, DNA after it's been damaged from UV. Now, 
What role, though, would this gene have to do with actually producing pigmentation in humans? I have no idea. <laughs> we still haven't figured that out yet. This is a trickier gene because it's so critical that you can't just simply knock this out in a mouse. That People have done that and the mouse dies. Okay. You have to do it. In, you know, there, ha- there are some clever ways where you could express it in very specific cell types and things like that. But this is not as straightforward um, to figure out, but it's something we'd like to do in the future. But what I found really intriguing is when, I did a search for DDB1 and pigmentation. What starts coming up is that this is the main gene that causes pigmentation of tomatoes and makes them red. <laughs> and it is really conserved <laughs> across plants and humans, you know, multiple species. I find that fascinating. <laughs> you know, So I, I do believe this is playing a role, but we haven't yet figured out exactly um, what that is. And the other thing is that In that region, there are many genes that play a role in UV response, and it's entirely possible we found two independent associations. Both seem to play a role in regulating gene expression. Both seem to interact with the promoter of DDB1, but it's entirely possible that they're influencing expression of other genes in the region. So we need to be looking at other genes. But what was also fascinating about that region is um, we looked at the evolutionary history of these genes. and again, we actually collaborated with the brilliant population geneticist, um, Yoon Son, and uh, his postdoc, Ethan Jewett. And they were using something called coalescent modeling to look at the age of the different mutations from we were using some whole genome sequence data that was available. And um, then another postdoc in my lab, um, Shawa Fan, looked at signatures of selection. And what was really interesting is that we saw this Um, whopping signature of selection in that region, where basically um, it appears that when modern humans left Africa and they brought with them the chromosomes containing the variant associated with light skin, it just swept to almost 100% frequency, leaving behind this whopping signature, um, a a genomic footprint of selection, so that all the variation for hundreds of thousands of nucleotides in that region is essentially wiped out, particularly in East Asian populations, that's where it's most extreme. We see it to a lesser extent in European populations. So there's something very important about that region. And it may have nothing to do with being more lightly pigmented. It it probably has something to do with the fact that these genes in this region play a lot, many important roles um, on human physiology. And I, I just think it'll be fascinating to try to figure out what those are. Yeah. And then... Um, Lastly, at the last region that we found, we frankly almost completely ignored because it was at um, uh, two genes that are right next to each other called OCA2 and HERC2. And we thought, oh, well, that's already known. You know, those are just the variants that are already known. So we didn't really put much attention into that until right at the end. And then when we started digging in more closely, we realized that the mutations um, in HERC2 were independent in the African populations, were independent from the ones that had arisen in Europeans that have been shown to be associated with light skin and with blue eye color. So these arose independently. And we found another variant that was within an exon, but it's a synonymous variant, meaning it's not causing um, an amino acid change, but it was in exon 10 of OCA2. Now, this variant had been known. It was like out there. People had talked about it, but they never really talked about it being associated with skin color, with any phenotype. And it turns out that it is strongly associated with skin color. And unlike the variants at HERC2, which are in enhancer regions, and they regulate the expression of OCA2, and we were able to show that people with African ancestry have very high levels of OCA2, this mutation within OCA2 um, results in alternative splicing. So it results in either a people who have the variant associated with light skin have a shorter transcript. They're missing that um, that part, that exon gets spliced right out. And that exon happens to code for one of the transmembrane domains of this protein. So this protein has 12 transmembrane domains that loop through the cell wall, basically. It knocks it out. So that's going to have a major impact on that protein. It may completely make it non-functional, or it may somehow alter the function of that. What was intriguing is when we looked at the signature of selection in that region, we see a signature for balancing selection. 
meaning that these variants are maintained for a very, very long time. And it makes me wonder, what is this gene doing? And one of the intriguing things is that mutations in that same region cause albinism. Mm. And that's something that my lab is quite interested in studying. We're actually about to go back to Cameroon and to um, study albino populations there. Mm. I'm very curious about why it's so common in Africa. Uh, Could there be some... I don't know, could these variants be also playing a role in disease, infectious disease resistance, for example? Um, The other thing is that we were able to show that two things. One is that uh, the variants that are associated, that the mutations associated, the variants associated with skin color are old. So in half the cases, the um, ancestral allele is the light color allele, the one associated with light color, not the one associated with dark color. And secondly, when you look at the age of the derived uh, mutations or variants, they're really old. So the majority of them precede the origin of modern humans. So they've been around for a very, very long time, some of them more than a million years old. Um, so they've been segregating for a long time. And again, it does, you know, they, it could just be, you know, through chance, through drift, uh, but it could be that they have some other function that we don't know about that keeps them around for such a long period of time. And one of the other implications of this was that the variants that are associated with light skin were introduced outside of Africa during the migration out of Africa. So they actually had an African origin. Mm -hmm. And I think people were really surprised by that. (laughs) And it made them think a little bit more because people often think of skin color as a racial trait. It's a terrible way to characterize uh, races. And in fact, there is no biological um, basis to racial classifications, Mm -hmm. but people often do that. And we were able to show that, well, here's, you know, something people think of as being a racial characteristic, but it's not. But we're able to show that something like variants associated with light skin in Europeans, actually many of them originated in Africa. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other surprising thing for me was that one other region in the world where you see really darkly pigmented, two other regions actually, where you see darkly pigmented people is in South Asia and Australomelanesia. And you'll see people almost as darkly pigmented as, or as darkly pigmented as you'll see in Africa. And people, anthropologists had speculated that this trait arose independently through what we call convergent evolution um, in those regions due to um, uh, adaptation to a high UV environment. So that's sort of, I think, you know, that was sort of the hypothesis. And to our surprise, we found that the variants associated with dark skin in the African populations, the only other place we would typically see them outside of Africa is in South Asia and Australomelanesia. Hmm. And by looking at the chromosome background, the haplotype background, we we were able to show that they originated from Africa, from a migration out of Africa. They did not arise independently. And I thought that was just fascinating. It made me wonder about other um, traits in these regions amongst populations, including short stature among some populations there. Mm -hmm. Um, Certain hair phenotypes that are similar to what you see in Africa really made me wonder if maybe those didn't have an independent origin as we had thought, but that's going to clearly require further study. Is that something you would be interested in, height and hair type and other things that are easier to, to, to measure like skin color? Yes, that is something we're quite interested in. We're actually looking at um, variation in height in different African populations and uh-huh. looking for genetic associations. Would um, would weight not be a good thing to look at because it's so influenced by, by bad diet? So we are looking at weight as well. <laughs> it's clearly, as you say, influenced by diet. Um, but one of the things about working with um, the populations that we study in Africa are mainly minority populations in Africa, and they live in very remote areas and they're practicing indigenous lifestyles. We rarely see obesity. We Mm -hmm. rarely see Mm -hmm. hypertension. We rarely see diabetes. Um, So that's obviously because, you know, they're they're eating a very different diet. But Mm -hmm. when they move into the cities, you start seeing these diseases becoming very common. So when we look at these populations, you can imagine if you're interested in looking at genes that play a role in these traits and you're looking in a U.S. population, there's 
people, you can imagine all the variation in terms of diet and so many environmental factors. But in these African groups that we study, um, they're, they tend to be relatively homogeneous in terms of um, what they eat every day. Um, you know, if smoking is the norm, everybody's going to smoke. You know, there's a lot more homogeneity homogeneity within those populations in terms of environmental homogeneity. Mm -hmm. But one thing we can do is we could compare, for example, populations that have the same genetic ancestry who live in this rural areas with those who live in cities to try to disentangle genetic from environmental influences and vice versa. We can look at populations that have very different genetic ancestries, but they live in exactly the same village, let's say, Mm -hmm. Uh, very similar environmental exposures. And yet they have big differences in some traits. So, for example, we're studying a group called the Fulani, who are nomadic uh, pastoralists traditionally, uh, who are sort of across the Sahel in Africa. They're, you know, from Sudan all the way across to Western Africa. And uh, there's some settled groups in uh, Cameroon. They have um, relative resistance to malaria infection for reasons that we don't know. Hmm. And so, you know, and it's not due to sickle cell or any of the, mm-hmm. the variants that we already know about. There's something else going on in those populations. So, that's an example where, you know, people were able to distinguish that by comparing these two groups of very different genetic ancestries living in the same environment, getting the same number of mosquito bites, but one of them is more resistant to infection than the other. It, it seems, so your, your interest is Africa, but it seems to me that other parts of the world would be interesting to investigate in this way as well, right? Like I'm just thinking in the uh, in the U.S., you know, Native American populations versus uh, people who came from Europe would be interesting to compare them, right? Absolutely, as long as it's done in a culturally sensitive manner, because there yeah, sure. is a lot of concern by Native Americans about um, the use of their data for genetic studies. But again, it depends on what the study is. So if you're going to use it. If you have permission to use um, genetic information for studying diabetes, and if that's what they tell you you have permission to use it for, yeah, then yeah. you can do it. But then don't use it for something else <laughs> that sure, they may not sure. be happy about. That's been that's been a problem. But in in terms of your interest, you would you could probably trace the genes that came across from Asia right into the North America for for some of these uh, loci that you've been looking at, right? Or we can look at African people of African ancestry. Yeah. So there's an example where, you know, you're comparing ancestral populations in Africa living this different with different environments and now compare them to people of African descent in the Americas or in the U.S. in particular, who now have often have a higher risk for certain uh, diseases, including hypertension, kidney disease, and so on. And it might give us a clue about what are the genetic versus mm-hmm. environmental factors that are playing a role in those diseases. It's awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess getting back or, or wrapping up for um, this study in particular, I mean, just your great descriptions of it, Sarah. I mean, obviously, this is skin pigmentation is a pretty complex trait. And in fact, that's a formal definition that it is a complex trait, right? Could you say a little bit about that and maybe the contributions of the candidates you've been talking about, those handful, four or eight genes versus how much does this contribute to the, all of the genetics of skin pigmentation? Do you have estimates along those lines? Yes, you're absolutely correct. It is a complex trait, so there are multiple uh, genes that are playing a role. And uh, we estimate that we found these eight independent loci um, in those four regions, and together they account for roughly 30% of the variation in pigmentation in uh, the African populations that we studied. So for people who study complex traits, that's a huge amount. (laughs) So if you look at height, for example, There have been studies in hundreds of thousands of mainly Europeans, and they found hundreds of genes that are are playing a role in height, and each is having a tiny, tiny, tiny impact, and all together, they might account for 15% of the variation. So, 30% is high, but it's only 30%. (laughs) So, there's more out there, and there's more to to identify. Our guest has been Sarah Tishkoff from the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was really a fun conversation. By the way, we've gotten a bunch of emails about um, uh, the book contest. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, what's the latest on this? Yeah, we got a bunch of them in. So I think next time we'll uh, we'll read some of them and, and make a pick. Um, sounds good. Probably next time you and I will do a, an episode, I guess, right? That sounds good. Stay tuned for Twivo episode 29. Yeah, so if you... Uh, 
if you sent in an email for the book, we'll, we'll announce them next time because I have to go teach pretty soon here. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I guess if you still want to send some email in, you could. Um, it's fine. Not, not too late to get not a too late crack to at it. the book. Yeah, cool. I thought that was a fabulous uh, episode there with Sarah. It's great stuff. Oh, my, oh my gosh. Goodness. It's yeah, just so was... provocative and so much interesting stuff. I mean, I'm thinking of every human trait you'd want to look at. That's and see, right. And, yeah, yeah. and not just to know the basis of the trait, but to see how genes and populations have moved around the world, right? That's really fascinating. I find. Yeah. So much great work coming out in the sort of era of genomics, which where, you know, we're matching some of the genetic diversity to the techniques that allow you to catalog or describe it for some of the first times. Yeah. Really exciting time. And, yeah. and what she mentioned about infectious diseases is so true. I mean, while you're doing this, you can get hints about, you know, natural resistance to some infectious agents. Really, really interesting stuff. That's where a collaboration uh, with the virologist or or a parasitologist would really work out right exactly right that, that's where that that's your thing now is you get genes that that have undergone um conflict right with the pathogen you, over the year <laughs> that's right and some of these entanglement entanglements with things like skin color i mean there's in pigmentation i mean all that cell biology the lysosomal trafficking the melanosomes yeah yeah these have a lot of autoimmune or immune sort of entanglements. And so we're just glimpsing at some really interesting um, work here and, and interesting possibilities. So I would say yeah, you're preaching yeah. to the choir, as the old saying goes. Yeah. So Aunt, um, <laughs> Sarah has a bunch of papers, but one other one that I thought was cool, it's a review article in Nature, re tracing the peopling of the world through genomics. I love that kind of stuff. I'm just going to yeah. go read all of her papers now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea. You'll not be disappointed. And this is a great review um, that sort of lifts up how some of the genomic techniques, so, you know, some really real fundamental advances in being able to sequence the genomes of some of the archaic humans, so the Neanderthals, the Denisovians, and how this is really adding more texture to our understanding of our own evolutionary past. So yeah, let's put that link up as well. I love it because it's us, right? <laughs> People like to know where they came from, for right? sure. And it's, it's a more complicated and interesting story than you could have almost even imagined. That's, so, why, yeah. that's why people like things like 23andMe, right? You get to know who's out there that's related to you. Mm -hmm. And and this goes even back further. 300,000 years. Wow. <laughs> yeah, really fascinating that's stuff. great stuff. Yeah. All right. Well, should we move to our picks of the week? Yes, sir. Sounds good. So in addition to the fast, our own fascinating biology of our own species, um, we've heard from some listeners that we need to be paying attention to the incredible biological diversity among plants. And so as a little bit of a down payment, let's just say, as we're out there scouring for some <laughs> great <laughs> recent work, I wanted to highlight um, a blog and podcast. It's called In Defense of Plants. It's by Matt uh, Candias. Put the link up. I was just this weekend listened to one of the episodes of the podcast and it was on speciation, the um, evolution of one species into multiple species among both parasitic and carnivorous plants. So things like pitcher plants, Venus flytraps. And I'll put a second link here to one of the topics that came up on the podcast, which is what is called the shrew loo. And that's the <laughs> <laughs> this is slang for a shrew toilet. Uh, tree shrews have co-evolved, it appears, with some pitcher plants. And so the idea is, and you'll see this in this live science uh, link, that the pitcher plant doubles as a toilet. So the plant attracts the tree shoe with some nectar, some enticing nutrition. The shrew then positions itself right over the opening of the pitcher plant and relieves itself. And this is a way that the plant acquires nutrition. I love this as a kind of fascinating coevolution uh, story. So amazing diversity among the plants and a really interesting blog and podcast in defense of plants. That's my yeah, pick of the week. I just yeah. added the podcast to my podcast player. Oh, cool. Always looking for good science yeah. podcasts. Uh, we, if you remember last time, we had an email from a listener who suggested we do more plants, and she sent some suggestions. So uh, in between our next episode, I'll share them with you. Maybe we can do something. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Lines. Yeah. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? Well, I have a paper in PNAS, which I think um, everyone should be interested in. It's called Contribution of NIH Funding to New D Drug Approvals from 2010 to 2016. Oh, yeah. I think I saw this come across my Twitter feed, but I haven't taken a closer look. What is, what's yeah, going on? It just came out February 2018. 
Mm-hmm. Um, it is a, they, they looked at the contribution of funding from the National Institutes of Health to publish research associated with uh, new drugs. Mm-hmm. Bottom line here is that uh, every one of 210 new drugs approved by the FDA from 2010 to 2016 had NIH funding as part of the development of those drugs. Mm-hmm. The research was is over 200,000 years of grant funding, totaling over $100 billion. Over 90% of this funding is basic research related to the targets uh, on the drug action, right? So the point here, people in industry like to say, we developed these drugs, you know, ac- academics didn't do it. And I always bristle because, first of all, you all got your PhDs in academic <laughs> institutions, <laughs> yeah, sure, right? right. <laughs> and even yeah. if you got an MD, that was an academic institution too. Absolutely, absolutely. But there's so much basic research that goes into drug discovery. And I think it's just not fair to uh, to diss it. And so this paper shows, uh, you know, here are the hard numbers. And I yeah. think it's really important to realize this. I think it's great. And I you know, agree. I mean, I appreciate that NIH is a tough place to get money, and but what they fund can do a lot of great things and go a long way. And even it's not just worms and flies, which is all great stuff, but it's drugs that uh, uh, that humans can use. So, yep, the work really connects all the way through. And I think, you know, how can we maybe think about, re- in some sense, reclaiming the definition of translation to be more inclusive of a lot of research. And so instead of, you know, so if you're working in flies or worms or plants or you're in the rainforest, and, you know, as we're learning more about the world around us or how everything works, I mean, that's translational research. It's just maybe a little more distal. (laughs) And in that way, we're all really on the same team. It's just we're taking it at sort of different um, perspectives or different lengths from that ultimate uh, narrowly defined translation. Hey, the, the first people who were working on CRISPR, who knew they were doing translational research? There you go. Right? Adaptive immunity in bacteria. There you go. We did Beautiful. a paper on TWIP yesterday. It was a very interesting paper done by a single grad student. She she uh, caught uh, rodents in a preserve in Santa Barbara. Mm. She wanted to know if rats harbor raccoon roundworms, mm. right? Mm. It turns out that rats are a new reservoir for these worms. This is an introduced rat species. And this has implications for human health, so it's translational in, in effect, right? It there doesn't have to be simply, you know, making a drug to put in people to treat them. That's not all translational is. Yeah. I guess that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, we we're on the same page. All right. Fantastic. Great. Fun episode. Thanks, Quivo Vincent. 20. Thank you for, for bringing Sarah in. It was just fascinating, and I love it. I can't wait to see what more she does. Yeah, and maybe mm-hmm. maybe in five years, Nels, if we're still around, we'll we'll talk mm-hmm. about the albino study. That sounds uh, cool. Keep an eye on that. That's going to be fascinating. But even in the U.S., it would be cool to look at. You know, there's a wide variety of skin pigmentations, and oh boy, so many cool things: height, curly hair. What else? What other traits? Um, you can just go up and down the list of every human trait, and uh, you you hit a bullseye. I guess we know about eye color, right? We do to some degree, although even that I think is not uh, every, not every case. There's a lot of complex biology there too, mm. and some overlap with the skin pigmentation. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, great paper. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. And that is Tuivo twenty eight. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, Microbe TV slash Tuivo. Basically, if you listen to podcasts on some kind of player on your phone or tablet, just search for Tuivo, subscribe, and get every episode, which is twelve a year. So it's not onerous, and we'd like you to subscribe. That helps us out a lot. And if you like what we do, help us out financially, microbe.tv slash contribute. You can give a buck a month, and that would be great. Questions and comments. We do have a bunch lined up. We'll get them next time, but keep them coming. Twivo at microbe.tv. You can find Nels Eldy at cellvolution.org. He's on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thank you, Nels. Thank you, Vincent. Good to be with you as always. Always great to talk with you. You bet. It's a privilege, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same. Let's do it again in a couple yeah, weeks. <laughs> you bet. In fact, when we get off, we'll, we'll schedule it. How about that? Perfect. I'm Vincent Draconiello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music on Twivo is by Trampled by Turtles. They're at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious.